Pete, it's great to have you today. We talk a lot about labor, given that one of the big stances you've taken is to give employees more equity, to feel like they have a stake in the game. Yet we're sitting here in a country that is deeply divided. Labor is rebelling against the way corporate America has treated them. What do you think has gone wrong? Well, I think the social contract is broken. Uh, you're hearing from workers, they of course need fair wages and benefits, particularly in this inflationary environment we're in. They want more voice uh, in their work, and they want to feel trusted and, re and respected in, in the workplace. And I think ownership is not going to solve all of our problems, but I think as a part of a new social contract, this could be part of the answer. Because with ownership comes not just a financial stake, but comes information about the business, understanding the business plan and where the company is, is headed, and how you can contribute. And so it's really about that trust and respect. I, I trust you enough to make you an owner in the business. I respect you enough uh, to make you an owner in the business. So I, again, not gonna solve all of our problems, but I think, it's, I think it's a part of a bigger solution. And this is the very simple art of giving your employees some equity in the company. Well, it's much more than that. So that's the foundation. So the foundation is everyone becomes an owner uh, in the business, and then that becomes the, the base of a different type of operation, a different culture, where people, again, they get actual information about what is going on with the business, where are we headed, how can I uh, contribute. It's about teaching you know, financial literacy so people can get their own financial house in order but also understand some of the financial information that's going to be shared with them now that they are an owner uh, in, in the company. So that's, that's kind of the broader idea, the ethos of ownership. What does this mean in the context of the deals that you're doing? For example, you recently are employing this strategy with Simon & Schuster. So the, in every controlled transaction in the United States, we roll this model out, which is about employee ownership, giving people a voice, giving them financial information, teaching financial literacy. So that's the whole package of what we're doing. And so at Simon & Schuster, keep in mind this was a very small part of a very big company, Paramount. And so we've got this opportunity now to create our own culture, because this is going to be its own standalone business. And a part of the culture is going to be around inclusion and around, and not just financial inclusion, but also, again, making people feel they understand what's going on with the company, understand how they can contribute. So as we're developing the plan of how to create value, we're going to do it with the entirety of the workforce, not a few people in the C-suite. Now, how much of this comes with the understanding that the employees are one critical way to get returns? In this era, a lot of people are worried about the return profile of private equity moving forward. Where, where do you find returns in this era where leverage is not as cheap as it used to be? Well, returns, in my view, have got to come from doing something different with the business. I don't think you can predict where the economy is going. I don't think anyone knows. It's so complicated and so interrelated with other global economies. So picking where the U.S. is going in the next five years, I think, is very difficult. Where I think as a private equity firm, you can create alpha and outperform the public markets by a significant uh, extent is by dramatically improving the operations of a company. So what does that look like? That looks like, you know, we, we buy a manufacturing business and we go through and work with the, again, everyone in the company to drive productivity in the plant, scrap reduction, improve on time delivery and customer satisfaction. And it's a, a million little things that we're going to do to move the needle. And we're going to do that with everyone. And that is a part of how we deliver outperformance in our investments. Now, I'm sitting with you on a day that the market has been shaky. The market has been shaky for months now. Uh, rates have been soaring. What are the biggest challenges you're facing as a private equity investor today? Well, if you look at history, this environment is when private, out, private equity outperforms the most. So if you were to divide up historical periods of time into public markets do amazingly well, like 2010 to, to 2019, public markets are, you know, sideways, and public markets really are not doing as well. The further you go to that side of the public markets not doing so well, the outperformance of private equity expands. And why is that? It's because if you don't have a rising tide where just everyone's doing well, that operational improvement I mentioned shines through and really carries the day. And so you just pull further and further away from the public market. So I think it's a great time to be investing in private equity. But to your question, what are the challenges? And I'll tell you, each of these challenges has a flip side, which is it's an opportunity. There's less leverage available and debt is more expensive. Well, the good thing about that is it suppresses purchase prices. Um, people are uncertain about where the world's going. Well, that means you have less competition because everyone's on their heels. And if, and again, back to my point about don't try and time the market, but just evenly deploy a private equity fund over five years 
and remove that vintage risk, and, and in, in my view, you will outperform. So what does the market look like for you to deploy new capital in the next six months? We've been active. I mean, if you look at the United States, we've done two take privates, uh, Chase Corp and Circor. We've done two carve outs, one out of S&P uh, Global and then out of Paramount, we bought Simon & Schuster. So we're just staying on that steady pace. Uh, we've done most of probably what we're gonna do for the year uh, in the United States. My partner and I also see oversee Asia and Europe. We've probably got some more investing we're gonna do in, in each of those regions. But we're gonna stick with the plan, which is find good businesses that have untapped opportunity partner with the CEO and the entirety of the workforce to drive those changes. It's interesting you say you've probably done what you have done for this year because when you talk to the banking side of the industry, they say next year. It'll all come back next year. What is challenging about the rest of 2023? Well, when I made that comment, I was more just referring to we've kind of hit our linear pacing guidelines for, for the United States, uh, for the U.S. Uh, region in, in, our, in our main fund there. But what's challenging are those things that I mentioned, which is uncertain economic environment, high rates, who knows where rates are going from here, not that much financial leverage. I think what we're getting past is this reluctance to sell, where there was a period of time where people were looking back two years and saying, oh gosh, this was gonna be such a stellar investment for me to let go of it for anything other than what I had in my mind two years ago is hard to do. I think we've crossed that bridge, particularly in the public markets. And as you see, we've done two take privates in the US and two carve outs. And even in the private markets, I think the page is turning and people saying, all right, I'm resetting my expectations on what we're going to get for this business. Let us end where we started, which is with labor. There's been a lot of questions about the price of labor, about the availability of labor. What does it look like for you across your portfolio companies today? Well, uh, the, avail the National Association of Manufacturers does a survey every quarter where they ask CEOs, what are you most worried about? For the first time, maybe ever, certainly as long as I've been tracking it, the number one issue is CEOs are saying, I am worried about my ability to attract and retain talent. That concerns me more than supply chain, the, about where the economy is going, interest rates, inflation, that is the biggest problem. So, you know, we are gonna be short, we, we probably don't talk enough, of, demographics are one of those things, it's happening to us so slowly that people are numb to it. We have a demographic problem. We are gonna be short, just in manufacturing, two million workers by 2030. We've got baby boomers are gonna be fully retired you know, by 2030, 2032. The birth rate is way down from decades ago. Immigration is down. So how are we gonna get there? How are we gonna grow economically? And part of it is we've gotta get the labor participation rate back up. And part of that is back to where we started. What's the contract with labor? If you want people to, to work and get off the sidelines, it's gotta be more than what they're getting now. And uh, I know I always say this, I'm not saying ownership is the magic bullet, but as a part of a different kind of a way of operating, I think it could really matter.